Good morning. Good morning. Our call to worship this morning 
is from Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. And uh, you'll find no greater law to meditate on. Our sentences are from Psalm 71. In you, O Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Be to me a rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. For you, O Lord, are my hope, my trust, O Lord, from my youth. Amen. From Jeremiah. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, truly, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. And the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I point you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. Grace, mercy, and peace be with you from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. We stand, if you're able, for hymn number 364, My Jesus, I Love You.
And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do here also in your hometown the things that we heard you did at Capernaum. And truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up for three years and six months, and there was severe famine over all the land. There were also many lepers in Israel at the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built so that they might hurl him off the cliff. St. Peter's blood clock work over it. Absolutely. Bill? Uh, and he's operational well, and uh, we find out on the subject how bad it is with this COVID. All right. Surgery's done. Yeah. Waiting to see where we go from here. Yeah. All right. Well, we know who's going to go with you. Um, then Lansing is turning 30 
Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. As always, Lord, we're grateful that you hear us, that you want to hear from us. And Lord, we do come into your presence this morning to worship you, to give you praise and honor and glory because you are worthy of them. But Lord, also to bring to you our needs and our concerns and our requests. Father, we lift up to you all of those who are not able to be here. We pray that you would be with them watch over them. We pray, Lord, that they would know that they're on our hearts and that they're in your hands. We pray, Lord, for all of those who are home with sickness right now, that you would be with them, that you would minister to them. Father, we pray for Lauren as she's preparing for this surgery, that you would be with her. We pray, Lord, that your healing would flow to her. We pray, Lord, that you would open the right doors, that you would bring her everything that she needs, that this would go to the correct doctor, that it would be handled properly. Lord, we pray for Bridget that you would be with her and that you would minister to her. Lord, that you would show yourself in her situation. Father, we thank you that Debbie's surgery went well, and we pray, Lord, that you would give us good news and a good report following this. Lord, we know that you are in control and we trust you. Father, we pray that you'd be with George. We pray, Lord, for your touch for him. And Lord, we pray for Bill that this blood clot would dissolve safely and with no complications or problems. We thank you, Lord, that Ron is home, and we pray that you would continue your healing work in him, continue to strengthen him, continue to raise him up. Lord, we pray for Richard, that you would be with him as he's in the ICU. We pray, Lord, for your healing touch to flow through him, even where he is now, that the recovery would begin right now. And Lord, we pray for Daisy, that there would be healing in her life, and Father, we also pray that you would cause this insurance company to act in a manner that's not like them, to move swiftly and with compassion. We pray, Father, for Ben and for Tom, that you would bless them both. And Lord, we thank you for this milestone in their lives. We pray that you would continue to walk with them. Father, we pray for all of those who serve, whether it be military or the mission field or here at home. Lord, it's been a tough week in a lot of areas. We pray that you would be with those people. Watch over them. Keep them safe. Bring them home safely. Help them to do their jobs and do them well. Lord, for those families who have lost loved ones this week, we pray that you would be with them as well that your peace would flow through them. Lord, all of this we pray in Jesus' name. And we pray now as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Amen. And stand if you're able for hymn number 80. I love you, Lord.
us be a sweet sound in your ear today. You may be seated and come down to the offering of our lives. Yes. Sixty-sixth anniversary for Jim and Jim Well, we love you guys, and obviously you love each other.
Testament, it says that uh, you know, their, your bowels yearn for someone. Uh, basically, it means the same thing. Your belly, your heart, doesn't matter. It means the same thing. It means what's inside of you is crying out for someone else. That's what love is. When somebody else becomes more important than just me. Somebody that goes through life and all they care about is themselves and what they can get and what's in it for them. That is just about the saddest kind of life that you can have. So I would feel bad for anybody that doesn't have someone that they can love. And everybody has someone that they can love. Even if you don't know anybody, even if you're in a strange place and you don't have any friends, you can love a stranger on the street if they have a problem and you have the opportunity to help them, or even if you have the opportunity to make their day a little bit brighter by saying hi as you pass by. All the little things that we can do. It doesn't have to be huge things. It can be little things that we can do to just let people know what's inside of me wants something good for you. That's love. And that is kind of how God defines love. Because everything that's inside of him wants good for us. So much so that he even died on the cross for us. That's a lot of love right there. All right. <laughs> Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and gave himself for us. This brings us to our scripture for the day, 1 Corinthians 13. Father, as we look now to your word, we pray that you would guide everything that is said, everything that is heard that it would be only what is from you, in Jesus' name, amen. And yet I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put the ways of childhood behind me, for now, we see only a reflection as in a mirror, but then
then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. May the Lord add his blessing to his word. Now, looking at the scriptures and the lectionary and trying to decide which to choose the text for the sermon, I settled on this one a little bit uneasy. And then afterwards, I looked in the commentaries, and all of the seasoned preachers are saying, this is one of the most difficult scriptures to preach from in all of the Bible. Wow. Okay. Thanks for the encouragement, guys. Let's start at the beginning. Corinth. It's a city in southern Greece. In the Roman province of Achaia, during the times of the Roman Empire. Now, Greece, Greece kind of had a reputation. If you're familiar with the Greek mythology, the Greek gods, uh, Zeus and uh, Ares and Aphrodite and so forth, man, what a bunch of hedonistic characters. They were the most immoral beings ever imagined. And yes, they were imagined. They were in the habit of doing whatever they wanted, whenever they wanted, without regard for the consequences to anyone else. If you read through the Greek mythologies, that's basically how it worked. Now, even by the standards of pagan Greece, Corinth had a reputation for debauchery. So this place was really a not good area. Enter the Apostle Paul. Paul took three great missionary journeys in the course of his ministry, and during the second journey, he went to Corinth. If you want to read about that visit, it's covered in Acts chapter 18. You can look at that later. Basically, Paul went to Corinth he met with a couple other believers who were there, and he started going to the synagogue and reasoning with them, explaining to them how Jesus was the Messiah, and in some cases persuading them that Jesus was the Messiah. So a church was formed in Corinth. Of all places to put a church, yes, a church was formed in Corinth. The problem is, you can put a church in Corinth, but then you've got Corinth in the church. And so, they had issues. They had divisions in the church at a time when they needed unity and service and compassion. They had divisions and griping and backbiting and arguing. They had immorality in the church. Coming from a place of basically hedonism, they needed to learn that there's a big difference between being God-like in your behavior according to the Greek mythology and being godly in your behavior, according to the I am. A big difference. And that needed to be addressed. There was greed, there was sexual depravity, there was all kinds of things in the church that did not belong in the church. People needed to be instructed. There was idolatry. And not only was there idolatry, but there was idolatry that had far-reaching ramifications because there were some people who were going to be a part of 
church and who are going to worship the God of Israel. And at the same time, they were also still carrying on their previous pagan religions. And the two could not mix. They were oil and water. There were others who were in the church but had absolutely no issue with going and eating food that had been sacrificed to the idols because, hey, they're idols. There's no meaning to it. You can sacrifice whatever you want to the idol and it doesn't mean a thing because the idol is just that. It's an idol. And that was fine for them, but other people who weren't as strong in their faith would look at that and see, oh, well, brother so-and-so is eating food that was sacrificed to Zeus. I guess that means he still believes in Zeus. I wonder if that means I should still believe in Zeus. And it caused all kinds of problems. So people were being led astray. Some of them inadvertently. And so Paul addresses that. If you read through the book of 1 Corinthians, it is man, he covers the gamut. Everything that can go wrong in a church that is made up of people that don't have the foundation they need. Most of us have grown up as Christians. We were raised as Christians. We learned all of the Bible stories in Sunday school and we know all of the things that we're supposed to do and not supposed to do. And it's not that hard for us to know how we're supposed to act as a church. But for these guys, it was all new to them. It was a whole new way of life. And they're trying to figure it out and they're trying to wrap their heads around it. And it's not making, it's not making good progress right now. And so Paul is explaining to them everything that they need to know in order to behave and function like the church is supposed to. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about the spiritual gifts. We talked about the fact that the Spirit is the gift, but also about the spiritual gifts that God gives us faith, and word of wisdom, and word of knowledge, and tongues, and healing, and miracles, and all of these things. And now, Paul comes back to some of this, but he's putting it now in perspective. He's saying it doesn't matter if I speak in human language, or if I speak in tongues given by God whether I speak in the tongues of men or of angels. See, it doesn't matter if we prophesy, because where there is prophecy, it will eventually stop. It doesn't matter if we have all wisdom and all knowledge. It doesn't matter if we have so much faith that we can tell the mountain, move, and it goes. None of that matters if we don't have love. Apart from love, everything is empty. When the plate comes around and we put our envelope in, if our giving is because, oh, this is what we're supposed to do, it's Sunday, I put my offering in, or if we're giving because, well, you know, I don't want anybody to think that I don't care about the church, or the good of the church, or keeping the lights on, so, you know. or if we're giving because, hey, I want to make sure the heating bill gets paid, it's cold outside, I don't want it to be cold in here when I got to sit here for an hour. If we're giving for any other reason than that we love God because he first loved us, then our giving is coming from the wrong place. Giving apart from love is not Christian giving. We should be acting always from a place of love. 
How do I know if I'm acting from a place of love? Am I putting someone else first? Do we want to know if we're acting as in a, acting out of love? How does Paul describe it again? Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy, does not boast, is not proud, does not dishonor others, is not self-seeking, is not easily angered, keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. So, are we patient? Are we kind? Do we not envy? Do we not boast? Are we not proud? Do we not dishonor others? I have seen so many people try to get ahead by putting somebody else down, and it never works out. Are we self-seeking? Are we easily angered? Do we keep a record of wrongs? Why are you mad at them? Well, in 1977, they said, do we rejoice with the truth? Do we always protect? Do we always trust? Do we always hope? Do we always persevere, refuse to quit, no matter how hard it gets? doing all of those other things that came before. If we can honestly say that that describes us, then we are acting from a place of love. And guess what? Paul says, love never fails. So if that describes us, if that's where we're coming from, and if that's how we're acting, then we will never fail. Because that love will always emerge on top. That's how it works. Paul goes on to say, when I was a child, I behaved like a child, I thought like a child. But when I became a man, I put childish things behind me. The Corinthian church started out as baby Christians. They may have been all adults, but they were children in the faith. But as they grew and as they matured, they needed to put childish things behind them and start acting as adults. I've kind of thrown them under the bus a little bit, but there's a certain person in my life who constantly reminds me that he now considers himself a grown man. And my response is usually, okay, show me. Because I'm looking to see the responsibility. I'm looking to see the actions that go with the words. We need to be showing the actions that go with the words. It's not enough to be the church we need to be the church in love. Paul is saying, if you're going to church and you're going through the motions, but you're not acting out of love, then you're still acting as children. You're doing what you've been taught to do because you were taught to do it, but you don't understand the why. There comes to be a point where we realize the why of what we're doing. And usually our level of enthusiasm for doing it goes up. This is what Paul is talking about. It's not enough just to be the church. We need to know why we are the church. And it's all got to do with love. In the end, 
prayers faith, hope, and love. Faith, we go to Hebrews 11, we're told that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things that we don't see. Faith is how I know that Jesus rose on the third day. Faith is how I know that Jesus died on the cross for me. Faith is how I know that he is coming again for me. Faith is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's faith. closely related. They're both looking for the best in what's to come. But hope, I think, is a little more Romans 8.28 rather than John 3.16. For I know that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So where faith lets me say, I know for a fact that Jesus died for me rose again and is coming for me again. And one day I will see him face to face. Hope lets me say, in the meantime, before that happens, I'm going to continue to do what he wants me to do. All of that is good, Paul says. But the greatest thing is love the why of it all. The reason that Jesus died for me and rose again and the reason that he is coming again. The reason that I need to have that faith is because of his love. The reason that I have hope that he is going to continue to be with me and continue to use me as I go through this life is because of his love. And the reason that I need to have him with me as I go through this life so that I can continue to do what he wants me to do, what he calls me to do, is because of his love working in me for others. Love is the greatest of the three because love is the reason for it all. Love is the reason for the church. I need you to have faith. Without it, we're powerless. And I need you to have hope because without that, we can't get out of bed in the morning. But most of all, I need you to have love because love is the reason for the faith and the hope. Love is the reason for everything.
has come just before you and give you peace. Thank you. 